Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. UN investigators urge Security Council to refer Syria to the ICC. Hamas court charges four with slaying of Italian activist. And Hezbollah leader makes rare appearance at massive rally in Lebanon. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Our representative in New York, Samer Nader, reported that Lakhtar Brahimi will present a report on the results of his visit to Damascus at the United Nations General Assembly meeting that will be held at the end of the month. Regarding the impact of the ongoing violence and clashes in Syria, Cairo is hosting a ministerial meeting for the contact group on Syria, while UN investigators seek to refer the violations case to the International Criminal Court. Cairo is hosting the first ministerial level meeting for the four-way contact group on Syria, which includes Iran, Egypt, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia, in the presence of UN Arab League envoy Lakhtar Brahimi. In this framework, Brahimi briefed the Secretary General of the Arab League, Nabil al arabi on the results of his visit to Damascus and his meetings with President Bashar al-Assad, the opposition, and civil society representatives. On the other hand, UN investigators made a recommendation to the Security Council to refer the case of Syrian violations to the International Criminal Court and to take the appropriate procedures. While presenting his report at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, the chair of the Commission of Inquiry, Paolo Pinheiro, announced that human rights violations in Syria have recently witnessed an increase in number, pace, and intensity. A spokesman for the French Foreign Ministry called on all parties of the Syrian crisis to immediately end all violations of human rights, as well as international and humanitarian law. France also announced that it is looking into the means of referring the case to the International Criminal Court. Paris announced that this report includes compelling evidence against the regime in Damascus, which committed unprecedented crimes, and said that armed opposition groups must also refrain from committing unacceptable war crimes. On the ground, the clashes and media wars between the authority and the opposition continue. As Sana announced that regime forces were able to control the neighborhood of Al Midan in Aleppo, the head of the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Rami Abdel Rahman, announced to Agence France Presse that clashes continue in Al Midan and several areas in Aleppo. The Syrian Coordination Committees reported that 50 people were killed by security forces gunfire in several Syrian areas. Syrian TV announced that the security forces forces who were in charge of protecting the scientific research center in the Al-Zahra neighborhood of Aleppo and were backed by a unit of the regime's army, confronted an armed terrorist group by attempting to attack the center and inflicted heavy losses among its ranks. In Homs, a unit of the regime's army and an armed terrorist group clashed in the neighborhood of Bab Hud. Internationally, Chairman of the State Duma Foreign Affairs Committee, Alexei Abukov, warned that Islamist extremists will obtain power in Syria if al-Assad's regime collapses. Meanwhile, China renewed its rejection of any foreign intervention in Syria's internal affairs, as its foreign minister insisted that a political solution to the crisis must happen with the Syrian people's leadership. A military court in Gaza issued rulings that varied in prison terms, including a life sentence for two of the four accused for participating in the kidnapping and killing of pro-solidarity Italian activist Vittorio Aragoni. Aragoni was kidnapped and killed in the Gaza Strip in April of last year at the hands of a group that calls itself the Tawhid and Jihad Group. Far from the camera lens, the military court in Gaza issued its ruling against four Palestinian youths accused of participating in an operation in which they kidnapped and killed pro-solidarity Italian activist Vittorio Arigoni. Three of them are the primary accused, and one of them was sheltering the accused. The court issued multiple rulings. Two of the suspects were sentenced to life in hard labor, the third to ten years of hard labor, and for the one harboring them, a year of incarceration. 
Though subject to appeal, the decision left a positive impact among rights groups and friends of the late Aragoni. I feel joy because the court took into consideration the wishes of our friend Vittorio and his family as well by not issuing death sentences, which he regarded as a harsh punishment. The Gaza military court rulings regarded the kidnapping and killing of pro-solidarity Italian activist Vittorio Aragoni came over a year after the incident, an incident that had been met with great anger and criticism in various Palestinian circles. Aragoni had arrived to Gaza aboard one of the flotillas that aimed to end the siege. He settled there and united in solidarity with Palestinians' rights. On the 14th of April last year, an armed group that called itself the Sahabi Mohammed bin Maslama Brigade kidnapped Aragoni to demand the Gaza government release one of the Salafi group's leaders, as it stated in its declaration. Hours after the group posted the video, Aragoni was found dead in a home north of Gaza. The Gaza government's response at the time was swift and decisive. Their forces stormed a house in which some suspects in the incident had barricaded themselves. At the time, they refused to turn themselves in. Two were killed, among them a young man of Jordanian citizenship. It was an incident regarded by Palestinians as a deviation from their approach as well as their struggle, whose aim was always to win over and protect all those who sympathize and stand in solidarity with Palestine and its cause. الجزيرة غزة فلسطين Leader of the Lebanese resistance movement makes a surprise appearance among hundreds of thousands of protesters voicing their outrage in Beirut over a U.S. made film that offends Islam. We must close the door completely to any possibility to insult our Prophet and our Messenger and our Quran and our sanctities. And so we call because this issue concerns all the Muslims in all Muslim countries. Demonstrators shouted slogans against the U.S. and Israel. They also shouted slogans reaffirming their love for the great prophet. The demonstrators waved Lebanese flags and flags of the resistance movement Hezbollah. The leader of the movement had earlier called on the Lebanese people to pour onto the streets and protest against the film for a week. Currently, the demonstrators are set to march through the capital. Further protests are also set for several other cities. Demonstrations denouncing the film insulting the Prophet Muhammad, peace and prayers be upon him, have reached all parts of the world. Two people were martyred and others wounded during demonstrations in Pakistan. Afghanistan, Iran and Turkey have all witnessed similar protests. Al 
Protests denouncing the American film that insulted God's prophet Muhammad, peace and prayers be upon him and his followers, are still raging with force across the Islamic world. Protests and slogans of condemnation were renewed by religious scholars and students of religious studies during protest rallies witnessed across various Iranian cities. Through them, they affirmed that America cannot be trusted, for it is Islam's main enemy. The first to be accused of this crime are America and the Israeli entity. The protests affirmed that America and the Israeli entity, through their support for such works offensive to the holy sites, have uncovered their hidden ugly side under the cover of human rights and freedom of expression in the Western world. Protesters called for the punishment of the film's producers. Thousands of Pakistanis shouted calls to defend Islam's prophet Muhammad, peace and prayers be upon him and his followers, and took to the streets in all parts of the country to continue the mass demonstrations denouncing the offending film, demanding that its producers be held accountable. It is obvious that the American embassy must not operate in Pakistan until this film has been erased and those responsible choked to death. In the southern city of Hyderabad, one person was martyred. In Islamabad, two more were martyred and two protesters wounded during the demonstrations. Others were wounded and arrested in Karachi, Pakistan's largest city, during clashes with the police. The police were trying to prevent them from approaching the American consulate, which they pelted with rocks. On the street that houses the NATO alliance and the United States' bases in the Afghan capital Kabul, protesters marched against the film that insulted Islam. They burned the American flag and a portrait of President Barack Obama later stepping on them with their feet. It ought not to be allowed to show such films. It ought not to be permitted to insult the Quran, Islam and the Prophet. Peace and prayers be upon him and his followers. And Muslims' feelings must not be hurt from this moment on. With the the excuse of preventing damage to public and private property, Afghan police confronted the protest rallies that took place this morning, resulting in clashes between the police and protesters. Rage among Turks resulted in the burning of the American flag in demonstrations of protest against the film outside the American embassy in the capital Ankara as they chanted slogans calling for the punishment of its producers. Iran says the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, is distancing itself from its principle of fairness due to mismanagement and influence of certain countries. The head of Iran's atomic energy organization has warned that some states have been swaying the UN agency in its decision making. Speaking at a regular session of the IAEA, Feridun Abbasi highlighted the peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear energy program and stressed that Tehran is looking for a global nuclear disarmament. To this end, he said, the IAEA must start by disarming the countries that already possess stockpiles of nuclear weapons. Abbasi also referred to Tehran's goodwill cooperation with the agency to settle the Western claims over its nuclear energy program. Last year, I asked the Secretary General to offer an appropriate time for verifying my country's nuclear activities. But one year on, we have received no reply. IAEA is insisting on its former approach, which does not lead to any result. A wise solution requires being patient while verifying a member state's nuclear activities. Well, he also talked of a possible penetration by terrorists and saboteurs in the IAEA, adding there are enough reasons to be pessimistic about the agency's reports. With some examples, I can give you a clear picture of our concerns. On August 17th, the power lines from the city of Qom to the site of Fordo were cut by an explosion. 
power outage is one of the main ways to disrupt the operation of centrifuges. Immediately after the blast, IAEA inspectors asked for an unannounced visit to the site. Couldn't the call have any connections with the explosion? Who other than the inspectors can have access to the site to record the sabotage? Without a negotiated solution over the Iranian nuclear program, there will likely be a military confrontation in 2013 with Iran. This was the warning sounded by former U.S. Ambassador to Israel Martin Indyk in an interview with CBS. He explained to the Face the Nation news program the difficulties that Israel faces. Well, I think that Israel uh, is very nervous about uh, the rapid deterioration in its neighborhood. Uh, the turmoil that we see from here uh, they see from a much closer perspective. Uh, and that combines with the, uh, as the Prime Minister puts it, the race of Iran towards nuclear weapons capability, uh, the fear that the Egypt-Israel peace treaty will start to come apart, uh, the concern that um, in Syria the, uh, what's happening there could lead to an Islamist government taking over eventually there as well, but before that, a descent into chaos on their northern border. All of that, I think, makes them very nervous. And that's why the Prime Minister is coming out much more vocally than one might have expected in, in the midst of an election campaign here, uh, saying, you know, we need, we need reassurances, we need red lines against the Iranians, because from his point of view, that's, that's the greatest threat they face. Despite the lack of progress so far, the UN Atomic Watchdog will hold further talks with Iran aimed at clarifying concerns about its nuclear program. International Atomic Energy Agency Chief Yukaya Amano made the announcement today to the IAEA's annual member state gathering, stressing the agency is firmly committed to intensifying dialogue with Tehran. Amano gave no date for a possible new round of talks. However, it was announced today that EU foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton will meet tomorrow with Iran's chief nuclear no negotiator. German Chancellor Angela Merkel also chimed in on the Iranian issue, saying that a political solution is still possible. Merkel told a press conference today that Tehran posed a threat not only to Israel, but to the entire world. She emphasized, however, that she did not believe that the point had yet been reached where the search for political solutions had been exhausted. It is inconceivable that U.S. President Barack Obama cannot find the time to meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu face to face over the Iranian issue. This according to David Horowitz, the editor-in-chief of the Times of Israel, who spoke with IBA's Ariel O'Sullivan. I think it's, you know, it's a really bad situation in terms of the relationship between the United States and Israel over the issue of Iran. I think it's, it's unforgivable. I think it's a failure of leadership on both uh, sides because the threat to people who value the gift of life is Iran. And for Israel and America, instead of focusing on exposing Iran's irresponsibility, uh, viciousness towards its own people, danger to the international community, and um, marching towards a nuclear uh, weapon, uh, for them to be focusing on each other and each other's ostensible failures when it comes to grappling with Iran, you know, that's, that's a skewing of, of where attention and focus should be, and it's unforgivable. Uh, if it's a function of, of poor personal relations between Netanyahu and Obama, who mistrust each other, who each think the other is guilty of political machinations against each other, you know, they, they ought to get over it. I find it extraordinary that Obama and Netanyahu cannot find time to meet when uh, Netanyahu is, is, in, uh, is in the States at the end of the month. Understand that America is essentially, it is assuring Israel that it will thwart Iran, and it is trying to persuade Israel not to intervene militarily without uh, um, American support or at this stage. Therefore, in other words, America is telling Israel, place your destiny in our hands, which is a very, very dramatic request to make, maybe for the best of reasons. At the very least, the president should be able to find time to have every possible opportunity to speak face to face with the Israeli Prime Minister, of whom he is asking this you know, extraordinary subcontraction of Israeli security. I cannot think of what other appointment there could possibly be on the presidential calendar that would take precedence over meeting with the leader of a country that feels itself threatened with genocide and who, who you are asking to hold its fire. The following program contains graphic scenes that some viewers may find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised.
The deadly tribal confrontations that have been ongoing in Kenya for a month intensified concerns that acts of violence will prevail over the upcoming elections that will take place next March. The current clashes resulted in the deaths of over 100 people from two rival tribes. What makes the situation even more dangerous is that politicians seek to utilize the confrontations for their own gain in the elections, which has led to the expulsion of a minister from the current government. The killers arrived in the early morning. They were in the hundreds. They were armed with arrows, axes and darts. They set the homes in the village on fire and they beat the residents to death. They did not distinguish between children, the elderly or women. They committed a massacre. Jamila is an eight-year-old girl. An axe cut a large wound through her innocent face. She is still too afraid to even speak. But those who are able to speak, those who survived the massacre, tell horrific stories about what happened to them. The attackers were in three groups. The first set the houses on fire, the second kidnapped the wounded, and the third did the killing. This conflict takes place over land and water. On one side, there is the Pokemo, young farmers who produce crops on the banks of the Tana River in order to make money to pay for their daily needs. On the other side, there is the Orma tribe. They are Bedouin shepherds who are constantly in search of shelter for their animals. In the past, conflicts were resolved peacefully. But the shepherds armed themselves for protection, according to them. Some of them admit to being thirsty for revenge. In neighboring villages, religious clerics and politicians preach about the importance of security and peace. But there are those who believe that the land is not only important to the farmers, but to politicians who are using the conflicts to win the upcoming elections. When you have political power, then you have everything. If you have political power, then you have everything. There are many posts that you could win, and whoever wins has power and influence. That is enough reason to incite conflict. The Kenyan government pushed military forces to stop the confrontations, which killed over 100 people within a month. But there is increasing worry that the upcoming elections may turn into a bloody battle incited by senior politicians. This marks the 30th anniversary of the Sabra and Shatila massacre that occurred on September 16, 1982. The massacre lasted for three days and claimed the lives of a large number of martyrs, estimated between 3,500 and 5,000. The Palestinian people's history is filled with black days, and the darkest of them were the three days in which the Sabra and Shatila massacre was committed. On its 30th anniversary, it still remains a mark of disgrace on the face of the Israeli occupation. If only time had skipped these three days from mid-September 1982, if the evening of Wednesday the 15th of September had gone straight through to Sunday morning of that month, history would have changed and the thousands of victims among our people would have still been alive. They would not have been forced to face their gruesome deaths at the hands of criminals who lost their humanity and let loose as heartless killing machines that were directed to kill innocent people who did not commit any sins. They were only Palestinians, which is a sufficient reason to be targeted by Tel Aviv's generals. Hundreds of unarmed Palestinian women, children and elderly were slaughtered by criminals who had mastered killing innocent people at a bad time when Palestinians were left as a diaspora with no supporters. After three days, the darkness lifted and the occupation's atrocities in the camp were revealed. The result was thousands of martyrs and injured people among the Palestinians' ranks. They were subjected to this massacre as revenge for their resistance, before the siege that ended with international guarantees, most notably the protection of the camp's unarmed residents, after the Palestinian resistance left Beirut.
However, the countries who made these reassurances did not abide by their obligations and left innocent people to face their fate, being killed, massacred, without taking measures on the ground, only denunciation and condemnation, which still gives Israel a green light to conduct its crimes whenever and wherever it desires. The main goal of the massacre came in the form of terrorizing Palestinians to push them to migrate outside of Lebanon and also to incite sectarian strife there. This was a continuation of the strike that the Israeli invasion directed at the Palestinians' existence in Lebanon. لم تكن مجزرة صبرا وشتيلا أول المجازر الإسرائيلية التي ترتكب بحق شعبنا الفلسطيني. The Sabra and Shatila massacre was not the first Israeli massacre committed against our Palestinian people, and it certainly was not the last. It was preceded by the massacres of Kubia, Dir Yassin, and Tantura. It was followed by the Jenin massacre and the Gaza massacres. And despite the atrocities of the killings and destruction in Sabra and Shatila, something the entire world had witnessed, the criminals are still free. Mohammed Nofal, Palestine TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Winco Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. channel of uncompromising stories, world news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.